Welcome to the National Women's Fitness Academy podcast. We're here to talk about women's health, female hormones, body image, and all things health and fitness. Hello, girls, and welcome back to another episode of the Women's Fitness Academies podcast. I'm your host, Siggy, one of the WFA educators and a women's mindset and body image coach. Today's podcast is one of a fucking kind, and I'm so glad to be able to host this because I have opened this space to have a candid and insightful conversation focusing on various aspects of body image, from eating disorders to being um, a competitor athlete to your everyday girl who just wants to feel freaking good about herself from within and so much more. And I am joined by some well-educated and well-experienced women in this field. And I'm really looking forward to where today's conversation is going to take us. And I want to begin by opening today's conversation about societal perception of body image. And I know a lot of us could have been impacted by these different aspects of what we should be looking or what we should be doing. And I want to start off with Laura. How has societal perception of the ideal female body changed over the years? And how has that affected and impacted you as a woman today? I love this question because we are in a society and it has affected me personally. And I think that's why most of us get into the area of specialty that we do because we are obviously using our own story and then we study that niche. And I think that's beautiful to have that story connected with why we do what I do. So my background, I really suffered from poor body image basically my whole life. So thrown into modeling quite early on was just like throwing myself to the wolves because you are just being subjected based on your body. And then obviously getting into competing, like bikini modeling, it's very subjective of your body. So we have it hard enough as women, let alone throw in being subjected, subjectified to your body. It was like a disaster, basically a bomb for body image. So that's kind of where my passion for it came. But I feel like the biggest thing is we have such conflicting and ever-changing ideas of beauty. Not once is it ever, this is what the beauty ideal is. It's forever changing. And I feel like that can be really conflicting for women because we can never embrace our own beauty because society is always moving the post. And I feel like that is a really big issue because we're never doing the self-love work on who we are, what we have, and embracing being individual that we might look different because we're chasing this idea of looking like everyone else with this beauty standard that's ever chasing, we're ever chasing. And I feel like that is what's really conflicting in our brains. So that's kind of one thing that I think is a really big issue. And the second is we have a fear of being different. Mm. But how beautiful is it that we all look different? I mean, Siggy, you're rocking your curls. Mm -hmm. Like you girls all look different. Sammy with her glasses, like we are all so different. And we f- almost fear that. So that that's kind of where I would like to kind of dis- start that discussion. Mm, thank you so much for sharing that because the pressure of having or wanting to look a certain way comes down to the trends. And like you mentioned, trend comes in and goes. Like, for example, the Kim Kardashian trends, the big butts, the small waist. So many young girls are striving to look that way but not actually striving to what they're wanting to look individually they're seeking to look like someone else but not really being able to do the inner way going what do I want to wear what do I want to look like do I want to shave my head do I want to have a fringe do I want to color my hair blonde it's always wanting to look as a different type of person and you know what like it's quite challenging not to because we're so um, absorbed by it, especially with social media now we have it very different so it's very challenging not to compare yourself to your girlfriend, to a colleague, to a celebrity. Mm -hmm. Um, And I do feel having that sense of self, and again, that comes through years of work. And as you mentioned, Laura, that self-love, that's where you're actually able to identify what truly makes you happy. Corinne, I would love to Mm -hmm. uh, know your perspective around this. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, this is my entire PhD thesis, so I could talk about body image ideals until the cows come home, basically. But, you know, I, I firmly believe that the attitudes towards and the feelings that we have about our bodies um, need to be understood within the context of like our Western sociocultural history. The obsession that we have with our bodies is a uniquely Western preoccupation. This, this obsession in, in in Africa or Eastern cultures, for example, thinness is nowhere near as valorized as it is in our Western society. And it's more likely than not quite devalued in those societies. And when we're talking about ideal body standards, we're dealing with, like, like Laura said, a very heterogeneous social construct that has been invented by Western civilization. And it's one that's very fickle. It's readily changeable. And we can see that evolution. You know, we had Marilyn Monroe's curvaceous figure from the 1940s. And then we transitioned into Kate Moss's heron chic look from the 90s into the 2000s. And then, like you said, Ziggy, with, um, you know, the Kardashians, big booty, small waist, big breasts, like this propensity towards um, physical change and new body trends is incredibly pervasive and it just continues to develop. It's not something that stays stagnant, which is incredibly frustrating because then we're consistently trying to gravitate towards a goalpost that does keep moving. It's never that we can sit and embrace who we are as we are within the body. We're consistently looking for this externalized figure of beauty that is so changeable. Um, and, you know, if I was to quote one of my favorite philosophers, Susan Bordeaux, you know, culture, particularly the culture that we live in, has taught women to be insecure bodies, constantly monitoring ourselves for signs of imperfection, constantly engaged in physical improvement or whatever that means. And culture then constantly teaches women how to see bodies in a very specific way, in a way that is not about how we want to see ourselves, but how you know, the noise around us manipulates us into perceiving ourselves. So if I were to consider the, the biggest contributors to why we struggle with the bodies, with our bodies, the way we do, we have our culture on, on one side and the way that we have, you know, been raised over centuries and decades. And this can go back to even as early as the industrial revolution or even before that to the Renaissance, but also popular culture today which does a brilliant job, unfortunately, um, at perpetuating harmful body ideals that then contribute to the struggles that we have. But thankfully, because we also have the capacity to influence populations en masse, we do then have the means to actually challenge and resist that same archaic model. But it takes, you know, people like us, it takes, um, you know, groups like this to actually vocalise and speak and share and empower women the way that we do with our coaching services and the way that we do just as we are, because we are really passionate about this topic, but it can change. It just takes a lot of vocalizing and unlearning the behaviors that we have, you know, ingrained for centuries and for our whole lives, basically. Yes, I completely agree with every freaking word you just said Sammy I know you're very passionate about this topic I would love to um to have your input around this yeah look I really agree with everything that Laura and Corinna said I think it is such a big factor in terms of like meeting the beauty standards but I also think a really big chunk of it is just our innate need as people to want to be accepted you know to not want to stand out because acceptance is kind of safety I guess on a physiological level we don't want to stand out we're fearful of what other people think of us and so a lot of the time in people's pursuits of trying to have a certain body it's not just about the body itself it's about what that means and the meaning that they've assigned to that body is that I'll feel more confident. I will be more attractive to other people. I'll be more popular in whatever kind of way. And I think that's a really important part of the conversation is just the way we assign that meaning because historically we've seen that that's, you know, the thin privilege that is often upheld is that people in more sort of traditionally accepted bodies are seen really favorably or are given certain opportunities or, you know, become more famous on Instagram and all of those things that we see. Um, 
And so that's a lot of the work that I do with my clients is kind of separating those two parts of it and saying there's a body image part that is about the body and kind of what you're seeing as where you want to be and how you want to feel. But also there's the part that is really about fear of other people's judgments and, you know, unpacking that in itself to say it's okay to not actually fit in. It's okay to have a body that's different from the ideal. It's okay to not have everyone like you or find you attractive because at the end of the day, those goalposts do continually change. And so what other people see as an ideal body type is constantly changing and we just we just can never actually ever hit that target because it constantly moves. Mm, and you made such a good point around like the changes that are happening and us wanting to feel safe within knowing that we are accepted by others. Um, Steph, I know you're very big on the acceptance piece side of things, but also in regards to someone who suffers ADHD as well, because I know that piece comes into body image, into eating disorders and people with ADHD sometimes feel as if they're not accepted or they feel quite different. How does that body image piece come in together with that? Yeah, so let's define body image because I think a lot of people think body image is about how you look in the mirror. And a survey found that 56% of women and 43% of men are disappointed with their appearance. And what's interesting is in this room, there are so many women of different shapes, sizes, heights, and everyone struggles with it. And I think the biggest misconception is body image is about how you look in the mirror, whereas Body image is a mental picture we form of our body as a whole, which includes four aspects, how we see it, the physical characteristics, our body concept, which is our attitude towards the characteristics. We also have our body affect, which is how we feel about our body. And then our cognitive body image, which is what we think about our body. And people think if I change my body, then my body image will change when in fact it's not that case at all. Your body image really comes down to how you think, feel, and see yourself. And often if you have a poor body image, what you see in the mirror has been proven in research to actually change. So if you look in the mirror and you're thinking, I'm disgusting, I'm fat, and you're having all these negative connotations, you're actually going to visually see yourself as bigger than you are. So I think the biggest misconception is that it comes down to how your body looks, whereas in actual fact, it really comes down to how you think about your body and just leading it back to mental health or ADHD or anxiety. It can lead to a lot of mental health issues. And then mental health issues can also impact how you look, because I think the core belief it all comes to is I'm not good enough. And that's a big part of my appearance when in actual fact, it's not. Mm. I want to continue and open that conversation around common myths and I would love you to Steph to continue debunking some of these common myths around surrounding body image what are what is one of the most persuasive um, myths that you've come across the biggest myth with body image is that I believe when you look a certain way you will feel a certain way now I've met many women across the spectrum of body competitors, fitness competitors, women in larger bodies, and it's not how you look. There are women who are what we consider small or fit or toned and still have body image issues. And I ask women, I say, when you were at your smallest, your skinniest, were you your happiest? Hmm. And quite often it's not. But if they say, yeah, you know, I was so much more confident, I say, but yes, but what did it take to maintain that? What cost did that come at? And are you prepared to continue to live like that for the rest of your life? Mm, I can relate to that so much because for so many years, I was literally fighting myself to be the skinniest, smallest version, but I was at my unhealthiest weight physically, mentally, emotionally, whatever, like life was an absolute hell, but yet I was still just focused on having abs, having a small waist, the tiniest legs, you know, having a thigh gap. It's just like, fuck, like looking back going, wow, what was going through my mind back then to be wanting to do that? And 
unfortunately, it was the pressure from society. If society mm. is feeding us, you have to be your smallest version to look and to be happy. And it's just like, well, hold on a second. Why? And then once Why? you start, yeah, exactly. Once, once you start asking those questions and really pushing against the norm, quote unquote, is then you're able to rediscover yourself on such a healthier level. And this is what we do. This is literally what we teach our clients going, cool. If you want to diet, please tell me why. Because if that reasoning is just to be looking a certain way, we also need to make you understand that looking this certain way is not going to last forever. You're going to go through seasons all the time, but your body's changing. Like I'm, I'm, I'm my largest right now ever, but I am my happiest. Like go figure. Yeah, girl. Go figure. Um, Sammy, what are your, some of your common myths around body image? Um, yeah, I, st- I think Steph's right on the money with the main one of that most people think it is about your body because I've worked with so many people in societally accepted small, thin, slim bodies, even abs that have so many issues with their body image. And I see people in far bigger bodies who are really embracing themselves. And I think that's one thing that so many people just do get caught up on is like, okay, but if I if I hit that goal, if I reach my goal weight, everything's going to feel so much better. And that's certainly not true. But I think... Second to that is also the, I guess, how much weight we give to what we think people think, right? In that I think we see the way we see ourselves and we get really negative about our appearance and we think that everyone else thinks that, right? And really, truly, nobody gives a shit. (laughs) Really, very few people do at least. I'm not going to say that nobody would ever think a negative thought of someone else's body or say something because we know that that definitely happens from time to time. But I think when we're struggling with our own body image and we are so conscious of how we look and every little flaw, we think that other people notice that and we go, oh, I can't go to the beach because this people are going to look at my cellulite or my rolls and they're going to think all of these things. And truly, so few people care. I'm not going to say nobody, but I would say pretty close to nobody actually cares or even notices any of the stuff that you're thinking because everyone's so consumed with their own thoughts, you know, and that's such a big part of when we're chasing a certain body because we think that that's what's going to have people see us more positively. A lot of the time that doesn't even change the way that people see us on a connection-based level. It might be that people notice whether you've lost or gained weight, but they're not necessarily assigning that meaning to it that you are, whether it's better or worse. So I think a really large part of kind of doing this in a work on body image is to say, I can not like my body and maybe not necessarily be in the body that I feel is my best looking, but I can still see myself positively and separate those two things and say I have so much worth behind me as a person and I can dislike or not quite feel accepting of one small part of me which is my body or my appearance but I can also focus on this other 95 percent of what makes me great and really make sure that I'm amplifying those positive qualities because if you want to look a certain way to be accepted but you're putting all of your time and energy into this 5% of you that you think is what's going to get you liked and accepted, you're probably neglecting all of the other great parts of you that people already love, like your mental presence and being funny and engaging and you know smart. And if you're riddled with all of these thoughts about how you look in the moment or what you can do controlling your food, it really takes away from all those other positive qualities. Mm-hmm. It really does. And it's so interesting that we're having this conversation around this because too often we'll put so much pressure on ourselves to look a certain way. Again, going back to feeling accepted. And as you said, Sammy, like at the end of the day, no one really cares about what we look like. And to be honest, there's been few encounters that I would come across and someone would be like, oh, you've lost weight. Oh, you've gained weight. It's just like, cool. Like what was, what was the point of that conversation? Mm like why 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 are you telling me this do you want me to acknowledge that yes I've gained weight or like yes I've lost weight and most of the time the weight that I lose doesn't come because I want it it comes from fucking stress well that's the other thing you know a lot of the time people's weight loss or weight gain is from mental illness chronic illness stressful periods not being able to afford food and they lose weight and so when it comes to being 
praised for losing weight and kind of us seeing that as a an objectively good thing like it's not an inherently good thing to be in a smaller body because we don't know what it's taken to get to that smaller body and so that's why I think such a big part of body image work is not about loving your body necessarily I think that's a great place to strive for and I would love for everyone to love their body but that still has a large focus on you know your value and your appearance and I think really the sort of more body acceptance and body neutrality route is far more helpful in just saying that's just a part of me and I can not love it but I can live with it and I can see myself as a person that I love I can take care of myself in the body that I'm in now I can eat well not necessarily to control my weight or anything but because I care for myself I can move my body because I care for myself and I think that's a far better lens to come from. 100%. I totally agree with that. Laura, would you have any other myths that you could add? Yeah, I I think one that's big is that a a happy, healthy body looks a certain way. Mm -hmm. And again, we can, I don't want to say blame, but social media plays a big part in that because it's all around us before and after photos. You see the after photo, I am so happy now. But it's like, did they crash diet? Are you generally happy? And what's the after after photo? So it's Mm -hmm. so such a quick snapshot that our brain is like, oh, I'm happy in my after photo. And, you know, I, I don't think happy, healthy is a way you look. And I love what Steph said before about it's the way you feel, see, and your perception of yourself. Because even when it comes to the complexity of the brain, we have filter systems in the brain. Otherwise we cannot absorb all the information. Our head would literally explode, (laughs) not scientifically explode, not literally, but there's just, our brain cannot absorb all that information. So we have like an algorithm in the brain. And this is what's so fascinating. Think like TikTok, Instagram, we have this filter system based on our beliefs. So back to what Steph said, how we think and see and our perception of ourselves we're going to gather all this information to fit that belief. But if that belief is I need to be skinny to be happy, I need to be have abs to be healthy, then you're only going to see that around you. So it means your actions are going to be driven from that. So you're going to drive to like have these abs, even if it makes you lose your period or go crazy and have anxiety or make you grumpy and snappy. So I think one of the big myths is, that happy and a healthy body looks a certain way. And I feel like it really comes down to a happy, healthy body is your perception. And also body fat's not bad. It is not bad. We need it. It protects our organs. Women need a certain amount of body fat for fertility. So I think as well, society's demonized body fat that we need to have abs. But from a physiological point of view, women aren't meant to be shredded. We need to have fat around our organs. So I feel like that kind of links in too. So yeah, I I would say they're kind of other myths that shift our perceptions, that shift our filtration systems. So once we bring awareness to that, we can then start filtering out and Filtering in other beautiful qualities, as Sammy said. What about your personality? Like, I'm funny. I am funny. Like, all these other things about ourselves. You know, I'm quirky. That we've been inhibiting for so long. Mm, I completely agree with that. Thank you so much for sharing that. I can relate to um, the funny part. I know I'm fucking funny. So I'm. I know you're funny too. (laughs) (laughs) I see that quality in you. Thanks, babe. Corrine, um, do you have any common myths that have popped uh, in your head? I think I will add to the point about, you know, the smaller the body, the healthier it is. Oftentimes in, in being thin, we're given the promise of, you know, happiness, good health, positive self-esteem. But this is also predicated on the idea that any weight gain is a sign of poor health. And that then, of course, leads to the stigma, stigmatization and ostracization of larger bodies, which in turn creates, you know, problematic social implications for those larger bodies. And, you know, the reality is that we unfortunately live in a very fat phobic society that marginalizes, excludes and oppresses those who don't fit the norm, whatever that means. Um, but, you know, to follow on from what all the girls have said, it's A healthy body is not one shape, size, weight. It has so much more versatility to that. 
And the other thing I would also add, and I know that we're obviously a group of girls all talking about this, but body image concerns don't only affect women. You know, 57% of young boys in Australia are dissatisfied with their bodies. And that is a very alarming statistic. Um, in a study conducted in Australia with 50,000 adults, 41% of men thought that they were too heavy or were unnecessarily self-conscious about their weight or were too preoccupied with their bodies to actually go and enjoy time on the beach. And like you said as well, Sig, like no one actually gives a shit what we look like on the beach in our own time, in our own bodies, doing our own things. But we have this internalized perception that we need to look X way in order to be happy or valuable or to contribute positively to society. So, you know, in positions that, you know, we're in to advocate for body image, compassion, respect, appreciation. It's not just women. It's the men in our lives too. So opening up this conversation to those individuals and hopefully making that more accessible can hopefully then help to debunk those myths associated with body image is only a female's concern, but in actuality, it doesn't discriminate. I love that point so much because, again, obviously this conversation is around women's health and women's body image, but we also need to consider that men and people go through this on a daily basis and we don't, I feel as if we don't give men enough credit for their mental health as well. And something that really aggravates me, again, I don't know if that's a trigger that I need to just unpack it myself in my own time, there's this thing going around that people point out people's icks. And I know it comes mm. from a place of like fun and games. Too often that ick is instigated at men. Why? Why are we already instigating stuff at them when we're already quite unhappy about ourselves? I know, again, it could be like, ha ha, this is funny. But again, who knows, that may affect them even more in their case of their mental health and body image as well. Mm-hmm. And I'm so glad that you brought that point up because that takes me on to the next question, which is mainly directly to you, Corinne, and obviously um, us as well. From these myths about body image and training, obviously mm-hmm. there's many different views of body image around strength training but also I would love your perspective around this in the world of powerlifting. Like how does the involvement in powerlifting influence your perception or someone's perception of their own body image? Mm, I love this question. I love powerlifting. I've been competing for the past almost two years now. And it was a decision I made coming off the back of two um, physique contest preps and in the middle of COVID, my partner, who has been a, a competitive power lifter for longer than I have, introduced me to um, that side of strength training and I latched onto it so quickly. It was something that I found so rewarding um, and empowering for myself. And I even look back now at some of my old lifts where I've just progressed immeasurably since then, but just looking at how happy and excited I was in those moments just fills me with such joy. And I always want to encourage more people to explore maximal strength training. So for anyone who doesn't know, you know, powerlifting is a competitive strength sport. The goal is to lift as much weight as possible across the squat, bench and deadlift for one rep. Um, And it has been shown to be incredibly advantageous for um, body image. The research that we have at the moment, it's not extensive, but there is research there. And it's those who do participate in maximal strength training exhibit a greater appreciation for the body's functionality. They proceed to reject body ideals and self-objectification. Fantastic. Um, And they learn to reframe the body as being less force-fed by society, which again, absolutely brilliant. And, you know, I think a lot of people will also argue that powerlifting has this, you know, traditional alignment with being a masculine sport associated with strength and aggression and power and muscularity, but it can also be seen as this beautiful rebellious activity for female athletes who are actively rejecting the social expectations of their bodies. Those who participate in powerlifting are not obsessed with having a thigh gap or shrinking themselves down. It's literally building yourself up to the biggest version and strongest version of yourself that you can. And like you, I am in 
probably the heaviest body that I've been in a very long time. I've been through all different phases. I've been 45 kilos. I've been 60 kilos. I've been 70 kilos. I've been everywhere. Um, and I am most happy and most content within my body, not necessarily with how I'm looking, but what I'm doing, what I love. And when I'm doing something that makes me feel like my soul is set on fire. And that's really what powerlifting does for me. And for myself, it's also just this perfect avenue to focus on more objective, tangible, and also sustainable measures of progression. There's there's nothing quite like watching your body transform in a way that, you know, you're doing things you never thought you could do, that your body, you never thought your body was capable of. Like in 12 months, I added 60 kilos to my total and I wasn't, you know, obsessed over the cuts in my quads or the detailing in my obliques. That didn't matter. That didn't matter to me. It was watching what I could do that gave me so much more enjoyment and empowerment. And I, with all my clients, we have a, a strong powerlifting focus with the group of guys and gals that I work with. And I've had the privilege of being able to watch everyone shift their perspective away from the aesthetics focus of what is visually appealing to what is performatively enjoyable. So what we do see with powerlifting, it's not just powerlifting in itself. And I'm sure you can attest to this as well, but strength training in general, just pushing your body to beyond its limits and surpassing what you think you could actually do and conquering those goals. That is what's most attractive. Amen. Seriously, there's nothing yeah. more than pushing heavy fucking weights. I literally did I love it this morning and I was just like, go me. Seriously. Yes. Good. It's so, yeah, it's so refreshing. Um, Steph, I know you're very big on training yourself and strength training. I would love your input around this with um, body image because, you know, you've gone through your journey of um, strength training, but also your own um, body image. Absolutely. And I did a post on Instagram about it this morning because I think I love the powerlifting and how it's focused on performance and not just, I'm going to lift weights for aesthetic purposes. I think the reason people can often have a very tumultuous and painful relationship with exercise and even just reflecting on anyone listening now, like what is your relationship with exercise? Because I know for me it was obsessional and then it was really avoidant and resentful. And now it's about what do I need? Do I strong? Do I feel tired? Do I need to stretch? And I think diet culture has made exercise this really painful experience for many people and they're almost traumatized for it. But many people find powerlifting or weightlifting such a healing process so focused on how you're going and go girl and you're so strong and you feel amazing when people support you and bring you up and that's going to make you feel confident and that's what's going to increase your body image not just how you look mm, it's so true and Laura I know you can testify to this because you've been heavily focused on your strength training this year and also last year and I would love your input around this from moving from being a model to advocating to strength training as more of a performance base not just aesthetics oh absolutely because that even back in the history of the modeling days you will never fit the box because you're too skinny you're too toned you're too big you're too this you're too that it's like well then what am I and what I found was I was so disconnected in my body and this is why I've created, you know, my business because it's to help reconnect you with your body. When was the last time you ate when you were hungry? You stopped eating when you were full. You recognize when you're in a stress state. You recognize overwhelm. You recognize you're anything other than calm. We live in a world where we're so disconnected. And I like to kind of give the analogy of we're in the passenger seat. We run on conditioned behaviors, conditioned thoughts, therefore conditioned actions. We're doing habits that don't serve us and we feel like we have no control. So when I transitioned from modeling workouts, I, aka cardio and faster training and, oh, let's never go back there. The biggest thing I learned was I needed to reconnect with my body. And this is what I help teach women now. It's how can I get them and think mind to muscle connection. If I need a squat, what muscles do I need to engage? 
What is the tempo that I'm following? I'm literally so connected in my body. And that translates into other areas of our life of reconnecting with our body. So think of it like practice of connecting in your body. And the other, I think, really important component, even if it's not strength training, because I'm really big on variety. If you know me, it's like basketball, which please, I did basketball yesterday. I got one out of 50 shots. So don't think I'm a basketballer, but boxing, basketball, running, I think it's strength training is so important, but it's also other types of movement as well. And from a brain perspective, what's really important is how can we shift our mental real estate from just focusing on on aesthetics? Because our whole mental real estate, when you're in diet culture, is thinking about restricting food. What body parts don't I like? I look in the mirror, I don't like my tummy. Like it's constantly filled with this. Whereas when you start learning strength training or boxing and trying to remember a hundred part combo, you're strengthening the part, different parts of your brain, like your prefrontal cortex and your mental real estate is being filled with other things. And again, that translates into real life because you're practicing thinking about other things and seeing it from like your body in a functional point of view. Like, yes, I oh, can't believe we got that 50 part combo. Oh, I'm so stoked. I've got my 22 minute 5k run. And I wasn't thinking about my body when I was doing the 5K run. I was just trying not to die. So my thoughts were, don't die, don't die, breathe. (laughs) Don't run like an elephant, (laughs) whatever your thoughts are. But that's practicing thinking about other things, seeing your body as all of you already said, like the functionality of your body. So I think, you know, the key thing here is that mind to muscle connection, reconnecting yourself to your body to practice that so you can like, hone in on your hunger, satiation hormones, stress management, but also allow for variety so you can practice um, opening up that mental real estate to learning new skills, learning new sports. And I think that's really powerful too. So we can kind of step out of the box of conditioned behaviors, conditioned thoughts and conditioned mental real estate. Mm, I can really relate to all of that on so many freaking levels. And I'm seeing all of you girls literally like nodding your heads Yeah, going, yes, yes, yes. And Sammy, I know you're a big advocate for exercise as well. And through your journey as well, you've gone through strength training, but I also know you're very big on listening to what your body actually needs on the day. And I think it was last week or the week before you put up a story saying that you had been feeling um, quite low and you were just going to take some chill out um, in the pool and you like jumped in the pool and you swam and just chilled. And it's something that a lot of people don't realize that we have the power within us to actually pull back and not constantly push And I would love to know, um, again, like what's your relationship and your tips around strength training as well? Yeah, um, I definitely am a big fan of strength training. It's something that I have done and loved for a really long time. And I went through a couple of years of competing in like bodybuilding shows. So I was like super, super into my strength work. Um, And for me, I think there has been just such a big chunk of my life that I have focused on whatever kind of exercise I was doing, it was based on how my body looked. And that started with just doing a lot of cardio and then it moved into strength training and revolving that around the bodybuilding shows I was doing was very much focused on using my training to get my body to look a certain way. Um, So in the past several years, I've really tried to shift away from training to look a certain way and really just focusing on training to feel a certain way. So that could be something different for everyone and as much as I would love everyone to do a little bit of strength training because I think it's so empowering and so like such a great way to really appreciate what our bodies can do it's also not for everyone and I think that it's just so important to figure out a way that you can move your body in a way that feels good and that might be one particular kind of training or like Laura said it could be different all of the time and that's really what I try and embrace now more than anything is just listening to my body each day and trying to move fairly regularly. I usually do around four movement sessions a week, but that might be occasionally in gym. It might be a workout at home. It could be a run that I'm somehow convincing myself that I'm a runner at the moment. And I'm not, I'm not built to run, but I'm just loving challenging myself in a new way. And I think for me, it's just been about 
getting outside, putting my headphones on, trying something that is different, that challenges me, not just physically, but mentally. You know, running is a, a mental endurance sport. I tell you what, <laughs> to keep my legs moving when I do not want them to move is really tough. But that has given me such a new appreciation for my body and what it can do, but not just focusing on the performance element, but just how does it make me feel afterwards? Do I feel proud? Do I get a sense of accomplishment? Is it about making a commitment to myself to move X amount of times per week and honoring that commitment? So I think there are so many deep levels to our relationship with exercise that we misconstrue a lot of the time when we just focus on how our body looks. But I think if we can take a step back and think about how does this make my body feel and how functional do I want to be in? Do I want to be able to carry all of my groceries in one go or do I want to be able to make it up the stairs when I'm 80 years old? All of these things are such a great way to build a positive relationship with exercise and to continue just caring for our body without scrutinizing the aesthetic side of it. Mm, it's so true. And I love the fact that you also opened the conversation around it's not solely just about powerlifting just about strength training it's literally about movement itself and through the last couple of years I've noticed that I'm shifting solely just focusing on strength training but more doing boxing doing a lot of embodiment work and mm -hmm. through my practices mainly spiritual practices around um, embodiment work it's moving energy through your body that's holding you back whether it's through like negative emotions anger resentment whatever it is because as women and also men we hold on to a lot of emotions within our body and sometimes we just don't know how to express it and push it out and i found the use of strength training boxing embodiment it's like literally releasing energy that we're holding on to and we know obviously with strength training it's so useful to our mental health as we've all said around the endorphins and then you get that dopamine effect of actually ticking that box and going oh I've done my workout fuck yeah go me and I want to finish today's conversation around mindset and how it matters so much with the role around body image and how it shapes us and Sammy I would love for you to open this conversation what are some practical steps individuals can start taking to develop more of a healthier body image mindset? Um, great question. And I'm so excited to hear what everyone else says, because I feel like I'm going to learn so much from this conversation. Um, I'd say probably the most common strategy that I use with my clients is a super, super simple one. And I get them to just put the focus not on their body, but on themselves as a person, because really that's the goal of having a healthy body image. It's to see yourself as a person more positively, not necessarily just about your body. Um, so I usually have them write a list of things that they like about themselves that have nothing to do with their body. I try and encourage them to get it to at least 20 things, which sometimes is a challenge and sometimes they take it and run with it and come back many, many more things, which is so amazing. Um, and what I have them do is when they're noticing a negative body image thought, whether it's their jeans are a little tight or they've gained weight or whatever it, they, it may be, they come back to that list of positive personality traits, qualities, skills, all of these things that they've listed that they love themselves for or other people love them for. And I get them to just pick one of the things from the list. So say for you, Sigurd, it would be that you're really funny. And if you had that you're funny on the list and you're like, I'm not feeling great about my body today, you could pick I'm funny from the list and think about as many memories as you can think of of you being really funny, times that you've been just crying, laughing with someone on a road trip or you told a really funny story or joke at a dinner and think about how that felt in that moment. And then I want you to ask yourself, if I were 10 kilos heavier or 10 kilos lighter, would that change my ability to create that moment? Because 99.9% .9 of the time, the answer is no. Even if you're like, oh, but if I was heavier, I would be as confident. That's not your body though, that's your mind telling you you can't do that. You would still be the same funny person on the inside. And so what that does is it just gives a little more emphasis to the things that are actually truly impactful and the things that we love about ourselves and, and that everyone around us loves us for because at the end of the day, you can change your body and you can feel better about your body and that's wonderful. But really the goal is to feel good within yourself. And I think there are so many things that we already have in us that we love about ourselves that our body doesn't change we just kind of forget so I think that's a really great reminder to just write that list and then refer back to it if you're ever having a bit of an off day 
I'm such a big advocate of that list. I do something similar with my clients as well. And too often, I swear, you're very nice. You'd be like, yeah, 20 things. I'm like, give me a (laughs) hundred. Literally, I'm like. That's hard work. Yeah, I know. But it gets them thinking. Yeah. It really gets them thinking. And the more I'm able to get them more in depth of understanding why they're so solely focused on the body image so much more comes up and I'm sure you can relate to this as a counselor as well Sammy is Mm -hmm. you know there's a lot of emotion that holds us back from um, wanting to be ourselves because due to our looks and we tend to think oh people are not going to like us because x y and z and um, Laura I know you're very big on this uh, especially around the mindset side of things and teaching your clients um, ways of understanding through brain techniques. Is there something that comes to mind right now that you would like to share? Yeah, well, I think my kind of manda- um, modality I teach is the science, which is kind of like the neuroscience of how the brain actually works. Because I think when it comes to behavior change, I see mindset as the perception of how you see yourself. And this ties into what Steph said right at the start of the conversation around body image. So If we have a certain perception, we think we can't change. So the first thing is, and you can hear me getting really passionate about it because I might yell, but the first thing is you can change. You have to believe you can change. And the science tells us if we have a fixed mindset of I can't change, I'm always going to be like this, I've never, and we're using that language. Again, the filtration system, our thoughts dictate our feelings, dictate our actions. We're going to stay stuck. So the first thing is understand from a neuroscience point of view, your brain can change. And that's what this whole idea of neuroplasticity is. People in their nineties can change. But the two key things I like to tell women before they even start with me is your brain is working so efficiently. If you have default habits and you're doing habits that you don't serve you, if you don't like the way you are, the way you look, your brain is working so efficiently and perfectly because of conditioned behaviors because of our amygdala firing. So the structure of your brain's working perfectly, but now we just need to change the defaults. Now we just need to change your views, your limiting beliefs. So the first thing is understanding it takes self-awareness. That's number one. Become aware of your thoughts. Become aware of how you feel. Become aware of your actions. Because even in a day, we have up to 80,000 thoughts and we run on 95% autopilot. That's 95% of the time your thoughts are habitual. You look in the same mirror, which evokes the same response about the same body parts, and you're not even bringing conscious awareness. So bring that self-awareness. And the second thing is deliberate practice and effort. So this means once we're aware of our conditioned thoughts, our conditioned behaviors, the behaviors we want to change, how can we start putting in that deliberate practice? And that takes effort. But you can do it. So I think the really big thing here is because go back to what I was talking about earlier on about the filter system. If you have limiting beliefs about who you are, about um, dieting, about basically anything, you are going to find evidence to support it. And like Sammy said, start building that evidence and break that limiting belief, create a new belief and your brain will find evidence for it. So a really good example I'll leave you on is If I keep thinking, I don't want, like, you know, my next partner, I don't like this. I don't like that. I don't like this. Your brain is going to find all the things you don't want because that is what you're bringing into focus. So start focusing on what you do want. So instead of focusing, I don't want to feel like this. I don't want to be like this. What do you want to feel like? Paint that identity for me. What's your current identity and what's the identity you want? Who do you want to become? And then how can we start making choices that align with that person? So I think that that for me is just the key to behavior change and mindset, just shifting your perception of yourself. Mm, Definitely. It's really coming from a different point of view. And like you mentioned, like I completely agree with this. And self-awareness is such a huge piece for people because, again, 70% of people don't have the awareness that we're talking about right now. And someone might be listening going, well, I do X, Y, and Z, how am I supposed to stop? Well, it's going back to what Sammy said. It's writing down a list of the things that you do love about yourself and either 
putting it on your mirror or your fridge or whatever and constantly reminding yourself. And then, Laura, what you mentioned is changing the language. Language is so important. And too often we hear the most common sayings is I should and I can't. Like the, those are the most common ways of, oh, I should be doing this. I should be doing, oh, no, I can't do this. I can't do that. It's just like you're constantly feeding this negativity. So when it comes to body image, as you mentioned, Laura, it's changing that perception going, what do you wish for? What do you fucking desire? And really literally like tapping into that and constantly validating and reaffirming to you that it is possible. And again, like you said, like changing habits takes time and that's okay. And that's something that we constantly have to remind ourselves. I'm sure all of us have been through very challenging times where your brain's just like, I just want to fucking give up. I want to burn everything down and just like go and live on a fucking island. Well, I I know this anyway. These, these are the thoughts that go through my head. But we also know that's not realistic. That's not how we chat. Like that's not how we go about challenging things because we know we're very strong human beings, but we also are very capable to adapting to change and through repetition and through newer um, habits. Steph, what's your um, point of view on this? Yeah, so I'm going to talk about two things, two strategies, psychological and behavioral. So in Food Freedom, which is a 12-week transformation I run, we have a whole body image module and it starts with awareness and we do a body image audit because a big part of a negative body image comes from something called body checking. And for 24 hours, I get people to log every time they check their body. When did they touch their collarbones? When did they pinch their fat? When they looked in the mirror and to log their thoughts and they are astounded by how much body checking they do, looking at their stomach rolls on their lunch break, looking at the girl walking down the street thinking she's thinner than me. Comparison is a massive type of body and shape checking. So one strategy I get people to do is Instead of comparing yourself to people who are thinner and more attractive, because this is what we do, this is called visual adaptation. And what it means is if we are constantly looking at people who are skinnier, more toned, more attractive, we think that is normal in our brain and we see ourselves as outliers and defective. So I say to people, I want you to go out and compare yourself to every third person you see or every third person who's a similar age or demographic to you. And what they'll see is so different because as mentioned earlier, your brain looks through the parameters you provide it with. So by doing this exercise, you'll see, oh my gosh, everyone else doesn't have a perfect body or even thin girls have cellulite or stretch marks, et cetera. So it's a very powerful exercise. And then the second thing is to change the way you feel, you have to change the way you think. But Steph, I don't believe it. What am I supposed to say that I'm, you know, skinny, whatever it is? No, you don't have to believe it, but it doesn't have to be positive. It just needs to be effective. So rather than saying, oh, you know, I'm so lazy. I didn't go to the gym today. I'm disgusting. Say my body needed rest today and I'm going to go tomorrow and that's okay. Because effective thinking is what gets effective results. You don't have to be positive all the time. You have to be effective and hating your body doesn't change it so we can work on body image resilience and getting better at that on a day-to-day basis Mm, it's such a powerful way of looking at it and I love the exercise that you get them to do because too often people don't realize how often they body check themselves it's Mm -hmm. really interesting and too too often when you count those numbers, you're like, oh wow, like I'm very focused on my looks like right now. It's just like how how do we change that? How how can we adapt a healthier relationship? And you also made a good point. It's not just being positive about it all the time, because again, that's also another element of of body positivity, you know, constant like love and light and rainbows and, you know, butterflies. It's just like, (laughs) let's bring it back to reality. You're not going to feel your best every day. And I love the aspect that you went about it. It's going, cool, acknowledging your worst days, acknowledge your neutral days and continue acknowledging the good days as well. And that's how you'll be progressing further along that. Um, Kareen, what are your thoughts around this, babe? 
I personally like to take my clients through what I consider to be three crucial steps to foster healthy body image healing. Um, The first step involves drawing a body image roadmap or a timeline so that they can better understand the full picture of how their current body image understanding came to be. So you're starting with like the first memory that you can think of that impacted your relationship with your body. Um, and this for me, for example, was, you know, being bullied for the size of my nose or the color of my hair. And that was the first instance where I was effectively told, you know, something is wrong with you. And from there, I was then able to identify other plot points throughout my, you know, my childhood, my adolescence to where I am now, aspects that have influenced how I've come to understand my body. And that helps us understand the narrative that we have created or the narrative that we've fed into as we've grown up. The second involves unpacking the body image narrative by identifying core beliefs that are often attached to an identity story. Um, And as we know, you know, emotional responses are these 90 second reactions and when not attached to a defining narrative or identity story, they are often very fleeting. So when we start to question, you know, um, ask yourself what is so you know bad about this core belief or you know what support do I have to demonstrate this negative de- belief? Where does it come from? Uh, what is it what is its origin story? What are the costs or benefits associated with this belief? Because oftentimes we ingrain certain habits and ways of thinking because it serves a specific purpose. but at some point it might not necessarily align with your values anymore. And then thirdly, I also encourage my clients to conduct a values analysis to actually question the narrative that they have created or the narrative that they have fed into. And you know what? Sometimes, you know, physical appearance or a particular body shape or size does happen to be a value that they um, put on a pedestal. But how much do you value that aspect? Is it only 10%? Is it 65%? Where is that value associated next to, say, um, your overall happiness and well-being, your mental health, your career achievements, your you know, family life, et cetera? Where does that value sit? And then we can also then start to actually think about body image investment and evaluation. Because if we have someone who has a very... Uh, you know, positive evaluation of themselves and high investment, they may actually still be quite discontent with themselves in the long term because they have this pervasive fear and anxiety associated with needing to maintain a certain weight or shape in order to, you know, preserve that satisfaction. We actually want to end up in a situation where we have um, a very positive evaluation for ourselves, which isn't necessarily body love all the time, but, you know, neutrality and respect and and acknowledgement, Um, but a really low investment uh, where we don't necessarily feel like we have to give our whole life dedicating to body image, you know, um, aspects or, you know, trying to preserve these certain tools and disciplinary strategies that, you know, force us within a specific way of being. It's about actually having that positive evaluation in absence of high investment. And I often find that by taking my clients through these few strategies, they are then able to actually unlearn a lot of the habits and behaviors that have gotten themselves to this place where they're mostly discontent and dissatisfied with their way of being and then are able to relearn and redevelop a way of thinking and being that helps them helps to empower themselves through language through self-awareness through education um, in a way that actually helps them to align with the values that they have now rather than continuing to foster beliefs and behaviors that actually do not no longer serve a purpose for them. Mm. So powerful to be able to have such a positive impact on our clients to make them reevaluate what um, what their actual core values are around their body image, but life in general. And I respect that so much, and I respect all of your expertise and opinions around this because there's so much valuable work around this. And I know a lot of this has to do around mindset. And as we mentioned from our conversation earlier on, too often we're not able to have that awareness to tap in and going, what is it that I'm actually 
wanting to to feel like, to be like, and not solely about the looks side of things. So for those who are listening and watching, I hope you have enjoyed today's insightful conversation and have um, learned a thing or two. I have for sure. Seriously, like having conversations like these and being able to bring all different perspectives and expertise, it really opens your mind to the possibility of change, but also to adaptability as well and realizing that body image is not necessarily just the physical aspect, but that it's like the doing, the being, the the living. So girls, I want to thank you again so much for your time here. I really, really value it. And for everyone who has been tuning in, if you enjoyed today's episode, please make sure that you screenshot it, tag us at the Women's Fitness Academy, tag us ladies, all the information is going to be in the show notes. And then till next time, be very um, kind to yourself. And when you notice yourself trying to pick apart a body check, take a step back, pull yourself back and be like, cool, where's the evidence that I am worthy? I am funny. 